Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. I just kind of abruptly started filming because I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We can't be, we, and usually the best of our conversations happen before the camera starts rolling. And so I am joined today with, with Eric and Angie, my friends. But before we get into it, can we just have a little conversation about the Barbie movie? Can we just for a second, for a second, just chill out for a moment. I'm going to have to tell you guys, I am excited to see the Barbie movie. I'm not going to go to the theater because I don't want to spend $100 to go to the movie theater because that's about how much it costs now, right? I'm going to wait for it to come out on Netflix or Amazon Prime. But I am so excited about this Barbie movie. Why? Because as a little girl, I freaking loved Barbie. My mother, if she's watching right now, can talk about this i had barbie dream house i had like multiple barbie cars i had a box full of barbies and one ken and i won't tell you something i actually just told this to my boyfriend the other day because i just thought about it and just how innocent i was as a kid i never put clothes on ken ken was always naked because it was too hard listen ken was rocking too hard. hard it was too hard <laughs> Ken was rocking skinny jeans before skinny jeans were a thing for men. And to get those freaking clothes on that plastic doll was way too hard. So Ken was naked all the time and he just had pretend clothes on. But Barbie changed all the time. And I would play Barbies forever. And we were just talking about it. And there's such a wave in our community of people all upset. I just feel like... um you know, we always make fun of the other side of being woke and be offend and being offended so easily. But our side also gets offended really easily. And everybody just needs to chill the fuck down. Calm the fuck down. Because Barbie, people are all upset about this Barbie movie for whatever reason. And people have, other people are like, what do you guys want? Finally, we have a movie that's binary. We have girls and boys. Barbies and Kens, right? This is what we've been wanting. A binary movie. And, oh, but people are upset because apparently, and I haven't seen the movie yet, but apparently when they're in Barbie world, the Mattel Barbie world, the Barbies are in charge, not the Kents. And so people are like hooting and hollering over how that's, you know, the men should be the men. And it's like, no, you dumbasses. This is through the mind's eye of a child. These dolls were created for children. What nine times out of ten, little girls are going to play Barbies, right? Not I had. I don't have any brothers. I allowed have, to play Barbies. I could only have one Barbie, and she was a brunette, and her name was Darcy Doc, and she had to stay on a stand. Because I don't think oh. my dad wanted me seeing those big old boobies. And those stuff. big old boobies and that tiny waist. Yeah. <laughs> Those heathen Barbies. Oh, I had so oh, many. No, but I was so there was a I Barbie loved kid. to go to my friends' houses, and they had all the pink stuff everywhere. They had the Barbie Jeep, the Dream House, all the stuff, and I would just, like, <gasps> nut up over it. And maybe that's why I kind of stayed kind of a little girl for a long time. Like, I was older, like, still playing, like, school and dolls. And Oh, you know. I remember. So I, I will say this. Sorry, Eric. No, Sorry. <laughs> Talking about girl stuff. But um, so, you can for now on. Like, I know. <laughs> well, I, grew, I had, there were I we I was all girls in my family. I had a sister, I have two stepsisters, all girls. And um, my dad had two sisters, and my mom had three sisters. So a lot of girls, a lot of XX chromosomes. But I have a lot of male cousins. And my mom's side of the family, my cousins and my mom's side of the family, we were raised like brothers and sisters. So my grandparents died young, and so we were always together, like always together. We would go where Angie is right now. She's in Charleston, where my mom is from. We would go spend our summers there in the same house with my cousins. So we grew up like siblings on my, on my mom's side, not on my dad's side, but on my mom's side. And I will tell you, Barbies, I had a lot of male cousins, but for the girls, Barbies was a girl thing. Like the boys never played Barbies with us. It was such a special, It's and that's what I want to say. It's like the mind's eye of a child. So for all these people that are so upset because Barbie rules the roof, like that's the little girl mentality. The little girl is the one playing in that imaginary world of Barbie. So sit, sit the fuck down, calm down. It's just a movie. Not everything to, to have this black and white viewpoint that we have to paint everything from Hollywood as black is a sign of a mental disorder. You guys, there's complexities here. Not every actor is bad. Not every director is bad. Most of them are probably good. 
And until you have actual hardcore evidence, and I'm not talking about a picture with one eye, that's not evidence. Until you have actual hardcore evidence, do not go vigilante violent on innocent people's assets. It's not cool. And it makes you, it makes you an evil person, right? So, so anyway, it, vigilante violence is never okay. That's why in the United States, because all three of us here are Americans, our one thing our forefathers did right was our court system was that everything is everyone is innocent until proven, proven guilty, proven by hardcore facts. Right. So so we got to just relax and enjoy our lives. I, for one, am very excited. And I think they casted that really well. Margot Robbie as Barbie. The main Barbie, she looks like Barbie. I'm sorry. I just watched a movie with her um, where she, uh, it's an old movie. I didn't even realize she played Tanya Harding. Really? And she did a fucking fantastic job. I, I, I think it was Amazon Prime or Peacock. I saw it the other day and I watched it. She was amazing as Tanya Harding. She played her throughout the whole debacle with Nancy Kerrigan. And I watched some of the skating scenes. And I would go back, I put pause the movie, and I'd go to YouTube and pull it up. And the way she mimicked her hand, oh, it was just, it was perfect. It was perfect. Ryan Gosling as Ken, yes. <laughs> yes. Hey girl. Hey girl. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but my kids look like Ryan Gosling growing up. So <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to vent about that. Barbie is such a fantastic, I think it's awesome. It's bringing people together, regardless of what your political beliefs are, regardless of what your spiritual or religious beliefs are. We all know what Barbie is. And even if you're not a, a even if you were a little boy, you probably had a sister or a cousin who was a female who loved her Barbie. And uh, when my first niece was born, that was the most exciting thing for me was I was going to get to go and buy Barbies again. That was so uh, my nephew was all about the Legos and the trucks. And I had to learn a lot about boys toys with him. But when Jacqueline started to get to that age of Barbies, I was so excited to go back into that toy store and like look at all the Barbies again and just be in that childlike innocence. Right. When That's that innocence. daughter, she, I was so excited. She had all the Barbies, all of them. Like all of them. And I mean, I, cause I never had them. And I even gave her a birthday party one time. It was like a tea party. And I decorated the table with like Barbies. Like they were like the centerpieces and like they were each, each one was a different, like that was the place card. <laughs> oh, do y'all remember the Barbie cakes? Yes. I had, doll cakes. Cakes. I had doll cakes, you know, just a doll, but not the Barbie. So they would, so Eric, they would make, this was big in like the nineties, maybe late eighties, early nineties. They would make these cakes. We need to bring bring back the Barbie cakes because those were awesome. They would put the, a Barbie doll in the center and they would build a cake around it. So the cake was like a ball dress for Barbie. <laughs> I remember going to birthday. I never had a Barbie cake. My parents never got me a Barbie cake. But I remember going to little. But I will say, in defense of my parents, I had this weird thing when I was a kid. Um whenever it was my birthday, I never wanted anybody to sing happy birthday to me. I always hated it as a kid. Like I remember crying at, I was probably like four years old and I was in my grandmother's lap, like crying. Cause all my kids, I did not want them singing to me. So in defense of my parents, they probably got cakes and just passed out little pieces to people without blowing up. Cause I was like, no, do not sing to me anyway. Don't know where that came from, but that's probably why my parents never really went the extra mile to get a Barbie cake because I wasn't going to be blowing out any candles, right? So, but they would put a Barbie in and they would build a cake around it. And so you'd, you'd eat from the dress and then the, 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 the birthday girl had a little Barbie, you know? So we need to bring back the Barbie cakes. So anyway, I hope if you guys have all seen the Barbie movie, you enjoyed it. Um, again, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for it to come out. I'm sure it'll be out on a streaming platform very soon because last time I went to the movies was probably like 10 years ago. And, I mean, the price of movies is just through the roof at this point. And it's like the last movie I saw, this is really going to date me is like patch Adams with Robin Williams <laughs> or possibly cars with my children. Like <laughs> I know nothing about the kids <laughs> movies of late. I think I went to, I think my last movie, um, what, what was that movie? Um, they made two or three of them. It's the singing group from college, the, the, oh. Pella. No. what was it called? It had big names and it was a great movie. Um, the acapella group from college and Rebel Wilson was in it as fat Amy. 
big move. Anyway, the second one, I think I went with my friend Mark to the second one. <laughs> I, at Atlantic Station. This is like long before I even went to India. Like it was so long ago. And now I just mm. Listen, I sit in front of a screen all day. I will wait for that movie to come out. But you guys, let us know what you think of the Barbie movie down in the comment section below. I mean, you know, in a world where girls' toys are boys' toys and boys' toys are girls' toys, toys and nobody knows what a freaking woman is, can we not celebrate the fact that there's a Barbie movie where it's girls and boys, Barbies and Kens, and it's very defined who is who? I'm going through a stage right now where I, I told my daughter, I was like, I'm going to buy me a a pair of high heeled shoes, the glitterier, the better, like once a month. Girl, <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna wear them with everything. <laughs> Get that Barbie foot. Get that Barbie foot. Do I it. Them with me. I need to put them on today. Do Walk it. Walk in Island with a bathing suit on. <laughs> Girl, you might catch us. I mean, listen, you guys, before we go any further, I just want to give Angie a very special happy birthday because she's not in her regular location. She's actually in my mama's hometown right now, which is Charleston, South Carolina, one of the most magical places on earth. And she is having the time of her life. You guys make sure she's 50, flirty and free. So make sure you guys wish Miss Angie a very happy birthday because that is one thing. I love my friends' birthdays almost more than my own because it gives your friends a chance to celebrate you. So you guys make sure to take some time to celebrate Angie and let her know how much her presence in your life has meant to you because, you know, we all got each other. You know, if we're going to be in this Looney Tune crazy factory together this this gangster planet called earth at least we have each other so so make sure you guys wish angie a very very happy birthday but before we get into the topic at hand is there anything else you guys want to want to bring up before we move into the topic at hand eric's been quiet bless his heart bless his heart i, bless I his don't heart. know what to say <laughs> I, can't, I can't talk about transformers <laughs> That or or, or he-man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, I don't know if you got into, ever got into Transformers. He was really into Legos, though. Like, yes. really. Like, had to travel. We would have to travel to South Carolina a lot with <laughs> a car full of Legos. That's mm -hmm. my son. And I still have a trunk, a whole trunk that I've saved for my grandkids of all his Legos. They're so dang expensive. I was like, we are not. And all mm -hmm. I earned, the, I mean, all the ones I stepped on barefoot. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. I he would build them so fast. He would want the the whole, you know, the like, the, like whatever it was, a spaceship or whatever it was. And he would build it like in five, 10 minutes because he was he's very good like that. And then he'd say, really, I just wanted it for this one little part that I need to use for this thing that I'm trying yeah. to build. Oh, because you can move it. Yeah. <laughs> So my dollars and you just wanted that one little part. Like, it's mm -hmm. all he's very, very um, techie and engineering. Like, so do yeah. you guys remember your son might have been a little too old when this movie came out with the Lego movie? Do you remember the Lego movie? I used to get the Lego magazine even. <laughs> well, they had that Lego. Mo well, Charlie, my nephew, I'll tell this one story. We were in Hilton Head, South Carolina, which is another barrier island off the coast. Um, my mother lived there for a little while, too. So we go to Hilton Head every once in a while. And we were there as a family. And Charlie was probably like two years old at this time. And the, I can't Emmett. I think the main the main character of the Legos movie's name was Emmett, I believe. But they started creating these Lego sets with these little Emmets, and they were literally like this size of like a Lego man. Mm -hmm. And Charlie, my nephew, was like addicted to Emmett, and so this tiny little Emmett Lego toy had to go around with everywhere we went. Emmett had to come too. Like, and this was true in Atlanta as well, but I remember we were at Hilton Head and Emmett's hair, because, you know, the hair is like a Lego, so you, it, the hair would, Emmett's hair would fall off all the time. And so we would, be, it would be a panic stricken because we'd be like crawling on the floor as Charlie's pitching a fit because he can't find Emmett's hair. And it's like this big. So all these adults are on their <laughs> hands and knees, Charlie trying to find this like Emmett's hair. And we were walking to a restaurant and we were close to, um, if you guys are familiar with Hilton Head, there's this, uh, like, there's a shopping center kind of in the middle of the island with, like, a pig, uh, pig uh, Hilton Head is an island. So, it's, like, right in the middle of this. Like, Wiggly, like, yeah. And so, 
Yeah, and so we're walking, and I remember one, I think it was my stepbrother-in-law. Charlie was the only child at this point. He was two years old. There are no other grandkids. It was before the other grandkids uh, were born. And my brother, my stepbrother-in-law had Charlie on his shoulders, and Charlie was holding Emmett. And we were closer to the side where there was a, where it was beachy, so there was a lot of sand. And all of a sudden, Charlie starts screaming because he dropped Emmett somewhere. Somewhere along this boardwalk where all these people are, Charlie has now dropped this tiny little Lego dude. So it was my mom, my stepdad, me, my sister, my brother-in-law, my two stepsisters, their two boyfriends at the time who eventually became their husbands. All of us are on our hands and knees in public, crawling around the boardwalk, looking for this tiny little Emmett while Charlie is pitching a fit because he can't find it. We finally found Emmett. I think my sister went and purchased a couple of extra Emmets at that point just to make sure that never happened again, that if first Emmett got lost and couldn't be found, they could just quickly replace it with a new Emmett because when that child is screaming um, for that that little... little uh... I did that same thing with my firstborn's blankie. I had oh, several. Oh, multiple? Yeah, so that one would be clean all the time. <laughs> the things you will do the things that you will do for a child I, it's unbelievable the things people will i mean it's, it's i mean people in the watching this probably know this like i'm i'm not a parent but i'm an aunt the things i will do for my nieces and nephew they they can get me to do things no one else can get me to do you know because that, those little kids you know but anyway <laughs> Anyway, I guess Emmett's like the male Barbie. But all right, you guys, so let's get into it. Now, I'm going to have Eric introduce this topic because he's the one that brought it to our attention. So, Eric, I'm going to let you take it away. Okay, it's going to be real short because I don't have a lot of words. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so I was looking. I was. I have some friends that... that have health problems and stuff, you know, and, and I was looking around and I found this, this, there's a study that, that took place in Russia, like back in 1997 or something like that. Oh, you got it. Okay. Yes, yeah. Yes. So, um, this is, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it speaks for itself. There's different activations though that you can, so you can actually change your DNA, which is, wow. And you know. I just have a publishing house that said Sophia up there. I, I don't know, sort of, that just like caught my eye. <laughs> well, I will try. So, so Eric, I know you sent, I will put this link up under in the description box for you guys to, to read through it when you, when you get done watching this, but this is absolutely a true thing. And I don't even know if it's more or less changing your DNA versus activating it right. and we were talking about this before we started filming you know eric you had just watched one of my past videos on the missing tribes of israel do you want to tell the audience yeah okay so um there are 12 12 tribes of israel and um there are the 10 missing tribes but there are two strands of dna and we actually have 12 strands of DNA, but 10 of them are missing. Or maybe they aren't missing. Maybe they're just kind of hibernating, you know. Um, and I think, I think Bryce, you, you do a great job of explaining it more than I do. I mean. Well, it's all about, so we know um, from the law of one and from other that the darkness can't, I mean, the science, right? The darkness can't create anything. The only thing that can create anything is the light. And so when we look at that from the positive and negative polarity of personality types and people and entities, when we're talking about the controllers, the controllers are of the negative, so they can't create anything. All they can do is steal from the light or mimic the light. If they steal from the light, they'll invert it, right? So that's why I've been saying over and over again, we can't dismiss the pyramids. We can't dismiss all these, the eye of Horus, um, Isis, Osiris, because nothing was created by the darkness. So everything that in this world, every tool that they use, the darkness uses, was, was originally created for the light, right? And so we got to take it back and cleanse it and use it for the good. 
Well, when it comes to the 12 tribes of Israel, so if we're going back all the way back to Abraham, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of you. I am one of them and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. All right. So if we have people watching right now that are, we did not grow up Protestant. That was just a song we had to sing at church, <laughs> at Vacation Bible School. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you guys. I I remember being I remember being at Vacation Bible School. I was probably like six or seven years old. And I remember exactly what I had on. I had on pink shorts and like a striped shirt. And we had to sing that song. And I remember having this real creepy feeling <laughs> about mm -hmm. Father Abraham. I remember thinking, this man is kind of creepy. And why does he have so many wives? Like, this is weird. <laughs> you know. Um, so from the mouth of babes, right? Well, if we go back and, uh, you know, as I've done the missing books of the Bible and really gone to break down the Bible, you know, first of all, I'm going to just put this out there because this is fact. This is not theory. This is fact. There is a copyright on the Bible. Okay. Um, you can only get a copyright on something if you've created it. If you've, if like, if you got a copyright on a book, it's because you wrote it. I have a couple um, of of pieces of of storybook stuff that I've actually copyrighted that I have um, secured. I did it years ago, right? Because it's yours. You own it. the The royal family, the Windsors, own that copyright. Wow. Right. So if we look at what's happening, I'm, lot, I'm just wondering, are people actually really like, you know, say it every time you film because people need to get that. Yes, it's that the, the Bible is absolutely 100 percent not the word of God. Now, I want to be very clear about this. When we talk about this, I know for a fact I have a very strong faith in God. I'm a huge fan of God. Mm -hmm. So I want people to understand, first and foremost, that there is no book. God is not limited to a book. Mm -hmm. And if you think God is limited to a book, then I, I don't even know what to say. Right? And so what we're looking at, it's interesting. Um, have you guys seen the documentary Shiny Happy People on Amazon Prime? Of it. Yeah, parts of it. I, I don't know if I've seen it. It's good. Well, I've, I've done some breakdowns on the IBLP, which I will, if I can remember, I will put those videos down. Mm -hmm. in the description box below but i've watched shiny happy people i've um i wonder if rem has made some uh, extra itunes money off of it <laughs> really why i ever clicked on it i was like oh, the, the the REM song. Song. The REM, shiny happy people. yeah i don't even think the people in the cult know that that's an actual song by rem because they're not allowed to listen to secular music so um but uh but no so i, I watched this it's about this, the IBLP, which the Institute in Basic Life Principles, which was owned, it's a cult. It's owned by Bill Gothard, and it really attracts fundamentalist uh, Protestants, right? Um, mostly through the Baptist uh, Baptist section. Now, um, I've gone through recently and listened to other people's survivors on YouTube talk about, you know, in podcasts and stuff of their experiences mm -hmm. with the IBLP. And there's a reason why I'm bringing this up, guys, is because I've noticed a pattern with a lot of that, that what Bill Gothard did with the IBLP is no different than what's been done since the beginning from the Council of Nicaea. So, and this is all fact, you guys, this is not speculation. Um, when I set out to read the missing books of the Bible, I had no clue that was going to come down to me deconstructing the whole Christian church. Right. So and that's really what it is. And but anyway, I was watching another point I want to make is I was watching this documentary series. And I was listening to all these people talk about their parents and how their parents put them in very horrible circumstances because of the cult and all that kind of stuff. And um, and I was thinking about how, especially growing up Southern Protestant, how some of these teachings kind of crept into other Sure. Like, like I grew up Presbyterian, but my, my parents would have been viewed as like liberal heathens compared to the IBLP. Let me just, I mean, they practice no birth control. They practice quiverful, which means they have as many babies as they can. They don't wear, um, what I'm we wearing right now would be considered whorish because I'm showing my, sh my shoulders. I think Angie, even that sweater, cause it draws eyes to your to the uh, yeah i think yeah woo. <laughs> you know so 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 i grew up even though i grew up conservative christian my parents would have been considered like literal heathens compared to their teachings of, of conservatism and christianity and i was listening to jewelry the, i've seen you know, like jewelry uh, yeah not, not a lot of makeup i i i, I uh, was watching i was listening to people talk about their parents and i was 
thinking about my church growing up and the youth director I had, how I could see how that youth director could have taken us in that direction. However, if it wasn't for my mom, you know, my mom was the one that really made sure that didn't happen because, because, because we grew up knowing that God came first, school came second, and then church after. So my mother, giving a shout out to her, really was good about making sure that the church was not God. Like the church wasn't God. The church was a social circle of people, basically. And so when I got to high school, because I went to a a private school, we had certain requirements with the school where we we couldn't do like Wednesday night pro. A lot of lot of uh, Protestant churches do like Wednesday night programs. We couldn't in high school do that because we were required to be at the school. And that youth director did pitch a fit about that and called us all like unfaithful. My mother was like, "No, my job as your parent is to make sure you have an education. Church comes second. God is first, but God is not church." There's right. something, there's a little uh, uh, thing that I, I think I put it on Twitter recently where I said something like um, the people around you are either your circle or your cage. And yeah. That makes me think about these like small groups in these churches, these big mega churches now have these small groups and, you know, like they only like those are their therapists. You know, those yeah. Are their, yeah. It's so insular. Right. And I, I really have to know, I did grow up with a lot of trauma. From my school specifically in our but but i do have to really give it to my mother my mother um actually angie reminds me a lot of my mother in a lot of ways because my mother even though she's not not not, i mean angie's close to my i love you darling (laughs) she's close to my age but just the way she parents her children like it reminds me a lot of my mom because my mom even though my mother was a christian christian lady um she was very open-minded and very um we we were it was important for her for us to have a secular experience Mm -hmm. my mother got me my first bikini like you were just talking about your daughter getting her Barbie bathing suit. My mom, I remember I was probably like the eighth grade and it, we went to go bathing suit shopping for the summer. And my mother, because we had to go to the mall because there was no, you either had to order from a catalog or go to the mall. There was no internet back then. Um, mm-hmm. In case we got any young ones watching, like there there was no internet. So we had to go and actually go to the mall. And I remember my mother being like, Bryce, I think it's time for you to get a bikini. And I remember her like having me try it on and saying, look how cute you look. If I had your figure, I would just be wearing that bikini all the time. So it was my mother that got me a bikini. It was my mom. My parents, when we were inundated with secular music, you know, like we would listen to my parents when I was young, had all their old records from the 70s. So my sister and I would be in like the playroom, like work in the record player. As little kids, we knew how to do the record player. You know, and then, and then we moved to cassettes and CDs, but we knew how to play those Led Zeppelin records. And my parents, I was my mom grew up like me. I don't know her mm. history, but I was not allowed to do any of these things. So oh, no, my grandparents could party like the best of them. So my oh. mom learned it from her parents. So I will say like, oh, every- I went kind of like, this is my rebellion. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna buy me some Barbie shoes and wear a bikini. Um, yeah, I was like under the covers with my radio and a cassette tape, you know. And when the radio would play a song that I liked that I wasn't supposed to hear, you know, I wasn't just listening, I would like press record and I would make my own mixed tapes. Madonna, mm-hmm. I had the, all oh. the from Athens to Charleston. I listened to the Immaculate Collection. <laughs> I was like, I was oh, my- listen to that growing up and I'm going to dang listen to it. <laughs> yeah, mama. Well, and that's the Southerners. Like you either have in the South, you either have real fundamentalists like the IBLP people or you have Southerners. And I will tell you, my mama can out drink me even to this day. My mother will, and every, all of my aunts, my mom and my stepdad, even my sister, they all have bars in their houses. My grandparents, my mom's parents had two bars in their houses. They could part my grandparents. Holy shit. Could they party? And they would always be at church on Sunday morning. They might be drinking those bourbons and whiskeys on Saturday night, but they sure tell because they were Presbyterian. Yeah. Oh, is that, do Presbyterians, are we a little bit more wild? Yeah, they were more wild. I grew up Baptist and like primitive Baptist. And then Methodists were a little bit more free. And then the Presbyterians were free and then the episcopalians oh no well, episcopalians <laughs> my stepdad is an episcopalian no. and they ca- they're called wiscopalians <laughs> so that's the southern no. life so my mother i mean and my mother knows her bible like my mother knows mm-hmm. bible verses she's very oriented in faith however she's not indoctrinated into religion in that sense you know she's very much no the church is not god the church is not god and she and that that was very clear and so no your education 
God always comes first, but the church is not, your youth director is not God. So I'm really grateful for my mother and all my friends' parents did the same thing, basically. They're like, no, our kids need to go to school because our, our responsibility, they know about Jesus by now. They know, you know our responsibility is to make sure that they're prepared for life and to get into colleges and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So anyway, I, I wanted to make that very, very clear when I was listening to, but my point is when you study, if you watch the shiny, happy people documentary, you see how Bill Gother, the head of the IBLP kind of created these dogmatic rules to live by that created a high control organization, but they weren't necessarily biblical principles. They were manipulations of biz- uh, biblical principles. So what's happened since the council of Nicaea in the fourth century, this is what's been happening. And this is fact. The Bible has been altered so many times. I mean, so many times that nothing in that book can be taken seriously. And you can go back and read all the records of all the councils and see what the political persuasion they were looking for at that time. And that's what the council was doing to reset the Bible in order to push people into a certain narrative. So there was a council where they got rid of reincarnation. Because reincarnation is in all the missing books of the Bible. Yeshua, name wasn't Jesus, it was Yeshua, taught reincarnation. And there when and I'm gonna I, I kind of wanted to cover it on my channel, the whole the whole drama of what happened because literally people were killing each other in this council because they were assassinating each other because they wanted to take out reincarnation so that they had more control over the fear of people. So they could persuade the people more if they believe that this is what they're, what they're one and only life and they're one and only shot at salvation. So you can read, you can look all this stuff up, you guys. It's all out there and you can read it all about it. Like what happened, what happened was. And then you can go and look at the missing books that we have available and, and see where Yahshua is teaching reincarnation. You can read the missing books and see where he was never crucified, right? What is crucifixion? What is the 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 communion it's the eating and drinking of human flesh and human blood what are they preparing you to accept think about that right or to uh, the idea that some hu- other human being has to be sacrificed for you right that's very satanic yeah so when you start to see all this you start to see the big picture you go holy shit they've completely inverted everything in order to control us the word church why does anybody even ask why it's called a church and not a temple I never thought to ask that until I started researching it. Where does what is the etymology of the word church? Thank you, Jordan Maxwell, for breaking this news before he passed away. Mm. Church comes from the Scottish word kirk. This can be drawn all the way back to the Greek goddess Circe, who is a goddess of mind control. So she would hypnotize people and then feed off of their energy. So what do the bad guys do? Because we have to live under consent, right? We, we're under laws of consent. So we know this. They, they put things out there. They tell us the truth. It's, it's in plain sight. You're going to church. Hmm. You're going to a place where they're going to hypnotize you and feed off of you. Well, okay. I want to say, I just want to say that I think that, you know, we're talking about secular stuff, you know, and that's totally what church is. Totally secular. You know? Oh, yeah. Well, it's all in, inside of you. It's all inside yeah, of you. So that's what the point I'm getting at, too. Right. So we we go back to the uh, 12, a long way around getting to the 12 tribes of Israel. So so when we look at the missing books of the Bible, we look at all these characters in the Old Testament. And you guys can look at your Bible you got now and see that something's not right with these. Something's a little psychotic with these right. like, people. And the, they're not. I'm sorry. If you look at the way Abraham behaved, it's closer to Jeffrey Epstein mm. than Yeshua. I mean, for real, like closer to that. He was trafficking big time. That's in the it's in the Bible. He was trafficking. Listen, listen, Linda. Listen, Linda. Linda. Speaking, of, speaking of girls, I <laughs> promise you, no little girl is sitting at home dreaming about being a polygamist wife one day. Uh oh. No. And God created both men and and women equal, different, but equal. And so God cares about the woman's happiness just as much as the man. Um, They were doing human sacrifice. What in in the Old Testament, they call call it a burnt virginal offering. Y'all, what's that? Let's, Let's break this down. What's a burnt virginal offering? What's a virgin? A child. Child. 
What's burnt mean? I mean destroyed. Um, burn. Burned. Burn. Burn. So Moloch, who in the missing books of the Old Testament, Moloch is Yahweh. Dun, dun, dun. Moloch is Yahweh. How many Christians are like, I worship Yahweh? Well, honey, so does Hillary Clinton. My dad said that a couple of years ago. Now, well, now we know Hillary Clinton's out, out there worshiping Moloch and Yahweh too. You know, it's in those wiki wiki emails. Um, but so, so we're seeing what they're doing. Abraham, none of his line. This is the line of the controllers. So Jacob's children. And it's mind control. So even whenever I say my dad, you know, said this, it's not me like attacking my father. It's just, it's, it's like, I mean, there's been so much mind control. So know, and, much. I uh, we see it in our comment sections. Mm -hmm. so, people yeah. are so ready to take down the controllers, and and people are so they know that the that the schools are messed up, that politics is messed up, healthcare is messed up, but the church isn't. The church <laughs> is totally great. It's awesome. Right. There's every it's pure. It's it's awesome. No, honey, that's mm -hmm. at the top of the pyramid. Act of 1871, I believe, is when they created Washington, D.C., the three stripes on the D.C. flag. It stands for yeah. D.C., which is the military. London, which is like the wealth. And then the Vatican is that third stripe. And if you're a Protestant, honey, you have bent the knee to the Catholic Church, too. Protestants, are no, they have different belief systems, but they're all controlled. The Vatican literally just called in money from all the churches. So all the churches, this happened maybe a year ago, had to send all their money back to the Vatican. So, darling, I hate to break it to you, but your church is just as corrupt as health care, as politics. It's just as swampy, if not more swampy. It's controlling the swamp. It's, the, it's the, like the sea creatures. <laughs> That are controlling the swampy sea creatures mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that god is that way do you guys see what i'm saying i hope you, i know that you do but that you guys watching i want you to understand this so the what the church is done for me, the church is very very it's a cage it's a, it's a cult <laughs> it's very limiting it's control and it's fear you can't question uh, if, if you question things you're told that you're just losing your faith or that's mm -hmm. the devil yep. The devil tempting you. They no, that was called. Yep. Oh, she left the church. She didn't leave God. No, she didn't Actually, leave God. she found she God, God, and that's why she left the church. There's some great YouTube channels. I I can't. I used to watch a lot of these old. There are great YouTube channels that are are run by old pa people who used to be pastors and preachers, and they themselves read the missing books of the Bible and then walked away from their profession because of it. Because they realized that they were they were not only preaching Satanism. But they were preaching a lie. The reason why your preachers and your priests wear black robes, has anybody ever asked that question? I didn't until it I said out. It creeps me out. There's it's a the same as judges. Judges wear black robes. Why is that? It's because they're sworn into the cult of Satan. And I can Another see thing. Some people in there. Uh, I only go into churches now for like somebody's funeral that I yeah, was. Yeah, same. Right. Whatever. Another and thing. Go ahead, Eric. Sorry. Oh. Another thing, like <laughs> the uh, when they have the flags, the flags in the churches. Yeah, you know, right. what's that all about? Yeah. Not, so then the church is supposed to be a sovereign place where it's yeah. not political. Mm -hmm. It's a five hundred one c three, which is part of the right. government. Right. Well, the, the the black robes is because they've been sworn into the cult of Satan, and mm -hmm. no, not every preacher is aware of this. I'm going to say that not every. Some are. Some of the big ones are. They 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 are whistleblowers. I. Talk to some of them who actually, some of your favorite big old Billy Grahams, they were doing. No, I yeah. used to love me some Billy Graham. My grandma loved Billy Graham. And I, I know. Was like, you know, my mama loved Billy Graham, and she's accepted at this point that he was a Satanist. The other oh, day, he's he a bad like, dude. He was it's a Satanist. Bad dude. All these big ones are all there and they know what they're doing and, and they're doing those virginal burnt offerings, you guys. So anyway, we have to be aware. The more, but that is, that is the controller's saving grace is the church. As long as they can still control the church, they can still they still have control of the people. So anyway, so Satan is looking for you to look outside of yourself, right? Yahshua said the kingdom of heaven and hell lay inside of you. Right. So he created the 12 tribes of Israel coming from Jacob, which are his children, because he was also trafficking 
some ladies because you all those wives did not want to be his wife let's just be honest with you. they were forced into that right so we had all these sons those are the bloodlines of the controllers you guys that's who those are and you've been taught to venerate them okay so who are the real 12 tribes of israel because the darkness can't create anything it can only mimic who's the real royalty we are galactic yes <laughs> we are. because we have all those strands within us and we have to activate each one of them yep it's right. we are a hodgepodge and this is why and you guys it's in the book like they have in all in the missing books they left it in the, in the mm -hmm. talk about the watchers they talk about the beings coming down and in there's something meeting. politically they talk about like israel being last something yeah. like yeah, that's that us we are israel are yeah we're israel it's we it's us and that's and so we basically what that means the 10 so we have their 12 tribes of israel you mm -hmm. are genetically genetically you are made up of 12 different if not more 12 dominant galactic beings yeah. that were also created by god now mm -hmm. this is what the law of one says the cast that's what a lot of different we are literally the human species on planet earth are the most powerful in the ga galaxies in the cosmos yeah we think of other beings yeah. being so powerful the mm -hmm. old Indians, oh the lyrans we're 10 times more power why because we're all of them mixed so every single galactic group has abilities has things they can do we're a combination of all of that and once we activate all that you know there are yeah. some people that can channel different whatever but that um i mean i i have my own superpowers that i've activated yeah. you know and mm -hmm. somebody else has some others and then somebody but you know we're all i mean eventually golly i can't wait till I've got i know and people figure this out well let's let's talk about race for a second so they want us to believe that um black people come from africa white people come from europe no honey no no darling and they want us all to believe that we all came from africa listen i did my dna test before i realized i shouldn't have but i did it yeah no i i have coptic egyptian that's the only thing that comes from the african continent the rest of it so explain to riddle me that batman i'm also rh negative though like how is it that you're telling us we all come from africa but some of us don't have any african in us like it's just not adding up my friend it's not know. adding up i've never done that test thing I'm scared of it. I've got one. Like my oh, I, I, yeah, I, I never did it. And but I did notice, and I think I've told you this before on your channel, but um that I Googled myself and it said that I'm Middle Eastern and Egyptian. <laughs> I have Egyptian, yeah. So and I'm like, no, but just by Google, like just Googling my name, I'm like, well, <laughs> ten years ago it didn't say that. It would say I was just from Georgia and I was like from Albany, you know, like whatever. South Georgia girl, and now it says that I'm Middle Eastern Egyptian. I'm like, well, listen yeah, to this. So, I am. Well, I'm let's, <laughs> so before we get out, I just want to explain the race thing quickly. So when we look at DNA, when we look at the strands of DNA, your race has nothing to do with where you're from on the globe. It has to do with the dominant strands of your galactic DNA. So people who have are predominantly Syrian or from Cyrus, Cyrus. Cirrus, the, the constellation, not the radio, they're black. Yeah. Right? People who predominantly, uh, I know I'm a combination predominantly of Lyran, Octurian, and Palladium. So it has nothing to do with where you are on the globe. It has everything to do with where you come from galactically. And all of those galactic beings are, are equal to each other. And we knew that before we forgot that, before we were taught differently so the power lies within us because that we are that they just don't want you to know that they want you hunting through records to see where you go back to jacob when that's not true at all it's about your galactic heritage okay go on eric sorry okay so i thought it was weird my dad is 46 percent uk and i'm like 48 percent uk which is like how's that happen how does that happen <laughs> Do you anyway. know that my I was I was actually playing around on 23 uh, me last night so they sent me an email and I was like I haven't checked this out in a while and so I pulled it up and I was looking at my aunt's profile on it one of my aunts I won't say which one 
Mm. But she had a lot of, there was a region in France that pulled up for her where she had a lot of this region in France and not, I didn't have as much as that. And I was like, but my aunt is like my mom. So like, I mean, it's my full aunt. Like they have same, her parents or my grandparents. So this is just not making sense. And I will say on 23 me, I was laughing hysterically last night because they can, you can do this thing to look and see what, what your dominant traits are given your DNA. Nothing is correct about me. Right. They said I was not likely to have dimples. I have two dimples. Mm -hmm. They said I was highly likely to have a cleft chin. I don't have, no one in my family has a cleft chin. They said that it was highly likely that my earlobes were detached. They're attached. Um, they said it was highly likely that I would have very thin hair. My hair is super thick. Um, they they did get it right on the color. They got the color right. And they got anyway. They said I mm. was all these things, and I was like, none of this is true. Right. None of it is. None of it's me. So what are they actually looking for in our DNA when they can't even give us a real? Probably something to do with your blood. I know. Yeah. I know that's what Todd kept saying. Kept saying that. Um, the feds are going to show up at our house being like, we need to check you in. <laughs> <laughs> you got some, you got some good blood. You got that blood that we have. We, well, it's so funny. Um, my boyfriend used to make fun of me for being RH negative. Like, Oh, you, you know, you're part of that group. And I kept looking at him going, but you have a lot of the same side effects as I do. And so I had him test his blood. He's also RH negative. <laughs> mm. Like you were saying, you were saying, <laughs> so anyway, um, but yeah, guys, that's the, t and so now Eric, we were, now I have to applaud you, Eric, because I don't know if you guys have noticed you have lost a lot of weight, my friend, and you're looking real good. Oh, I don't know about all that. Every like, time I see you, you're looking thinner and thinner and more chiseled and more chiseled because you take a moment. Let's take a moment to, to talk about what you've been doing. You've been going to the gym and working out a lot, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. I just realized that, well, I go through these like spurts where I kind of I'll gain weight and then I'll 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 hate it and then I'll go to the gym, work it off, you know, and then I'm like, oh, I'm in a good I'm in a good stopping place right now, you know, but uh <laughs> and then I'll get back up. So it's I fluctuate, you know. So um you, you, you called me the other day and you said you said something to me about how you were having more like spiritual clarity. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So I'm on the treadmill and I'm just thinking. I'm thinking about the the uh, ten lost tribes, and um, <clears throat> and and how you said that uh, fire like creates, you know, and fire would be like when you work out. You know, that's how we create gets rid of useless junk, you know, just like a forest fire, how it burns all the undergrowth and everything, you know, and I was just thinking about I was thinking about what you said, you know, and I was like, oh, totally makes sense. Totally makes sense because you don't change. If you don't work out, if you don't exercise, you don't change, you know. And so, that is why a lot of the old ancient faiths, like the yoga people, like the yogis, um, like uh, the Egyptians, um, they incorporated a form of exercise into their spirituality because that's, and you also have to, and so when we look at the DNA, and this is, I told you, Eric, that this is very commonly known in the yoga world. If you practice yoga in this lifetime, you are changing literally changing the DNA structure seven generations below you. So if I were to have a child, because I've been doing yoga for 17 years, my DNA is now different than what it was when I started. And you can see that in the way people look, the way their bodies change. They have more spiritual clarity. Um, their skin looks healthier. And so if I were to have a child, the karma, the, the inherited karma that child would receive would be different than if I had had that child before doing yoga. That really makes a lot right. of sense to me. Yeah. Um, you know, I've always, I haven't really thought about the whole exercise part of it, but, but my grandmother telling me that she thought that I was put here to break a family curse with the women in the family. But I think that that's one of them. All the women in my family, I would say, especially on my mom's side are kind of 
you know, a lot of them were larger, you know, pot bellied, beautiful mm-hmm. women, very beautiful. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, you know, we were cookers and taking care of, you know, everyone else and not our, not themselves. Right. And so, yeah, so. And it changes. It change. So that is why people, um, like I always say, I will not go to a healer who isn't exercising because they're not moving their own energy, right? So when you're creating that sweat, you're, you're actually boiling. So we are mostly made up of water, salt water. You know, salt water is very healing. And um, in the tarot deck, what is, what is, what do the cups represent? Yeah, Emotion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a chalice of emotion. So your water, you know, when, when you go past like stale water, the water that hasn't moved, that's just been sitting there, it's stinky, it's gross, it's moldy. So you have to constantly, that's why like, like, you know, if you take your animal up to the mountains and, and where it's running water, it's fresh water, it's safer than a drink because the water is running, it's clean. So when you sweat, when you create that fire, you're creating a fire in your body, top is heat. You're also moving, so the sweat starts to come out. So you're moving emotion. You're moving water. Water that, if not moved, would get stale and stagnant. And that stale and stagnant water would also affect your DNA in a negative way, right? So Mm -hmm. I believe that the powers that be know this, and this is why they've got us into situations where we live very sedentary lives. So we're, we're, we're getting stuck, right? Um, and, and you don't have to be an Olympic athlete. You can just go for a 30 minute walk every day to get that, get mm-hmm. that movement up in your body to get that heat rising and to get that flushing happen. And when you actually, people notice a lot of times when they first start your create your creativity starts to improve You're clear headed. Some of my better ideas come to me when I'm on my yoga mat, you know, because you're moving that, that karma around. You're moving it. And so, um, I mean, kids, you see ki- kids are wild. Kids are like, they want to move. Like they want to, when they play outside, when they're playing on the, on the, you do take a kid to a playground, right? They're exercising. Mm-hmm. They feel it. They want to move. They want to swing from the monkey. Hey guys, I did the monkey bars a few, a while back. I was at the playground, my nephew, and I tried those monkey bars and I'm pretty strong. And I was like, holy fuck, this is hard. You know, and those kids are swinging on it like like they're freaking george of the jungle you know and um and and school is is just terrible too when my son was in kindergarten kindergarten or first grade i mean that that teacher tried to get me to put him on drugs to calm him down she had him sitting in a corner looking at the wall he would finish his work before anyone else Mm -hmm. and he was just bored out of his mind and he wasn't he wasn't you know doing anything like bad like mean to any other kids he just needed to be he needed to move. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I was the room mom that year. Mm-hmm. And so I got to see, I went in to, to um, put all the little snacks out for the Halloween party at the Catholic school. Mm. And I was like, well, where is, where's my son's seat? And she goes, oh, he's over there against the wall. Mm-hmm. Like, like, oh, oh no. <laughs> no. He, he finished that year out and then switched schools. I mean, I was, no, we're not doing this. It just, no. We're not. When I was a kid, we had recess he like twice on a drugs. Day. And I know he never, and I never did put him on drugs. He is so dang smart. He's so dang creative. I mean, everybody, I mean, that meets him is like, wow, what a, what a, you know, what a guy. Like, just, yeah. 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 Anyway, that's, that's another whole thing. But, you know, the movie. In the 90s, yeah. in the 80s and 90s, we had recess, recess like twice a day. We have morning recess and afternoon at recess. And we were only at school from like eight o'clock to two 30. So we weren't even, you know, and we had two recesses in that and a lunch. So they let us move. They let us play. They let us, you know, t- to get that energy out. But yeah, mm-hmm. and then we go home at like two 30. So you have the rest of the afternoon to play outside. And you know, it's, it's, um, it's, that's what kids need to do. And they know that kids will intuitively know that they, they don't dread it. They're not like, Oh my God, I got to go play. You know, like we dread going and exercising. They, that's one thing I like about Mar. Another thing I like about Marnie Alton is she often refers to this as play. Like your workout should be your playtime as an adult. It's your playtime. Right. And so, and, but kids are like, yeah, they want to go outside. They want to run. They want to like climb trees. You know, they want to, they want to jump. I mean, my nephew and nieces can jump on the trampoline. My, my sister's dog jumps on the trampoline. 
my sister will send me videos of the kids are at school and she's the, the freaking golden retriever Reba is like jumping on the trampoline by herself, you know, like, so, so, um, yeah, it's, it's super important, but that's, it's for your DNA. And so that's one thing and I've tried to do this for a long time on this channel. I really encourage people to start looking at exercise as something spiritual. Mm -hmm. It's something spiritual. Yeah, totally. Because, it, and also when you're in that moment of, of like, when you're on the treadmill, Eric, or you're, you know, running and it gets tough, you're up against yourself. So there's a mental meditation and a mental breakthrough that starts to happen too, when you start to realize your own strength and your own grit. And so all these things start to shift for you, not just, you know, the body. So, you know, you can tell a person's mental and spiritual health a lot of times by the state of their body. You know, if, if the body is healthy and fit, then chances are the mind is also pretty, you know, you look at it this way. I'll, I'll say um, if you see somebody that's extremely fit, I guarantee you, I would bet money on it that if you walked into their house, their house is very organized and clean. I guarantee you. If there's somebody out there that runs like five miles a day, guarantee you their bed is made up every day. So that that and that's just a very baseline example of what starts to happen is your habits start to change because you're changing the body is the minefield. And so what you think starts to, to play out in your body. But if you bring the body, the mind will then come. If you bring the mind, the body will then come. One, one can go before the other. So if you just bring yourself to that treadmill and you do 20 minutes on that treadmill, all of a sudden things are slowly going to start to change because the energy is now changing. The energy is moving and you're activating. You're becoming alive. Have you ever noticed, you guys, have you ever known people who are like hardcore athletes and there's like a light behind their eyes? Like they have a clarity behind their eyes. That other people, And it's because they're, they're moving their body. Right. My, my friend Jamie Soleil is that way. Like you look at her eyes and she's the, the, the Olympic ice skater. She's her eyes are very clear. Right. Mm -hmm. So and everybody has you don't have to be an Olympic ice skater. I'm not an athlete. Are you guys athletes? No. <laughs> no. I'm just a human being. You And, you know, people will come up with so many excuses. And I will tell you, those excuses are your programming. Because mm -hmm. the controllers don't want you knowing this. You want to start to act something very simple. You can. You don't have to buy a gym. If you, can, if you can't afford a gym membership, that's fine. You can go for a walk. There's so many great things on YouTube. 20 mm -hmm. minute exercise videos on YouTube that are free. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't do a whole lot. But I, I want to do more. So right now, I, I usually just kind of jog down my driveway and I kind of run back and forth on the flat ground, <laughs> like on the flat parts of the right. I live in a very hill. George is hilly. <laughs> George is very hilly. Um, girl, like, so back, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But in, in on this trip, I'm like, why didn't I think to bring my bicycle? Because I could have bicycled everywhere around here. I didn't know like what to expect when I got here. Um, but yeah, just you feel so much better. I do. I mean, I, I walk pretty much every day. I walk and I kind of do like the little run, walk, run, walk. And yeah. I do my, I do some of my little. It has to be, again, we're not, you're not, you don't need to be like a, a sports illustrated model. You just get your energy up. Just get your, your blood, you know. Okay. So what happened? So what? I'm not a scientist, um, but let's just break it down to like, you know, layman's terms. When your body has a fever, what is your body doing? So uh, clearing out toxins. It's, yeah. mm -hmm. it's heating up and heating up and getting rid of yeah. toxins. Mm -hmm. So when your body creates a fever, it's because it's burning up something that needs to be burnt out. A virus. As, as a it. Parent, I've never, I mean, unless my children's fever has gotten up to be above 103, I really don't I mean, and maybe i would give them something to help them sleep at night so they yeah. more comfortable. but i let them burn off those fevers and yeah. they would, you know and I, I mean, the last time my daughter my youngest went to i had to have a vaccine for school this is like several years ago but we go in there and um the nurse practitioner she says well your mother hasn't brought you in in so long you're not even in our system anymore and my daughter was like well I haven't been sick. She's like, you haven't even had the flu or anything. She's like, yeah, but it goes away in three days. I mean, you know, yeah. like we just like yeah. burn it off, you know, right. <laughs> yeah. no, like, exactly. you know three days, everything three days, you know, exactly. And that's what, so, so that fever, your body knows what to do. 
Your body, when it notices, ha, huh, there's a virus here, we're going to heat it up and we're going to burn it out. Well, that's what you're doing with exercise too. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing when you exercise. And what's what, what's another bit of, of exercise? A strengthened immune system. Mm -hmm. Your immune system. Right? And so so I, I want people, and I will put you guys, I will put, actually, I was going to, I'm going to put Angie on the spot. And, and Eric, if you want to come down for this too, I'll invite you. But Angie, when you get back to Georgia, I'm thinking I should come to your house and we should film ourselves doing a bar, a bar video together. Never done it. That's okay. I'll bring the weight. I'll bring the props. Oh, oh, you got to have like, okay. So my mom talks about something with a broom back from the seventies that they would do. Oh, I don't know that, but girl, I, <laughs> so you can watch us doing it and see like, we're not athletes. We're not like, we're just people moving our body. So that's, you, you don't, you don't, you're love not that wife. I would love that. Let's do I it. Oh, yeah, I would love it. We could be, could be and Eth, uh, Lucy and Ethel doing a, doing a bar class. But, you know, it's, it's you guys, because it's not, we're just asking, God gave you, the, so this, this, this is the thing, right? That's one thing that controllers are trying to do. They're trying to separate you from God. That's what church is trying to do. Church is trying to separate you from God. How do, what's the first time I even um, saw anything that you ever did, it was on the dark outpost, and you were talking about yoga. And it was the very first time, like, that I heard anyone speak about how the church was against yoga and you kind of remember this this is a while back yeah and it yeah it just really resonated with me and i was like wow yeah because i've heard that so much from the church and family and you know like yoga is like uh I don't know, just evil or something I'm like no, it's not. No, it isn't. And you ask people why what's their so what's your proof that yoga is evil uh -huh. well it's summoning demons What's your proof that it's, show me where it's summoning demons. They can't do it because it isn't. If you read the Yoga Sutras, which is the foundation of yoga, which is a 5,000 year old text, it's right, have it right here, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Patanjali is like a scientist. And the whole sutras are him taking notes as he's observing human beings and how human beings behave. And he talks about something called Ishvata. Ishvata is the Sanskrit word for God. One God, mono God, that's it. And he's saying in this whole sutras is that your own attachments to your ego, which is your false sense of self, is what is disassociating you from God. And so if you want to be in touch with God, truly be connected to God, then you have to break your ego. And that is that is the, the 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 whole foundation of yoga and then of course it uses the asana which is the the exercise portion the postures in order to ex exorcism what's the root word of exorcism uh, exercise exercise <laughs> right so ding, that's ding, ding. yoga is having you're in and, and, and that's one thing people are people are real ignorant and ignorance can be very dangerous and that's how wars can start people think hinduism is mul multiple gods it's not it's one god it's one god who's come to earth many many times so i remember i asked a hindu uncle once at one of the mandirs like what's the biggest difference between christianity and hinduism and the uncle said oh christians think god came to earth one time Hindus think God came to earth many, 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 many times. And I was like, that's probably more like it. <laughs> that's We keep fucking up. So that's yeah. probably more like it, you know? And so, and so it's a very devout connection. And so, so what in the Hindu faith, what people will do is they'll find the avatar, the Jesus, if you will, whatever avatar resonates with them mo most and that's their drissi that's their focal point to help them find connection to god whether that's hanuman or ganesh it's their focal point they have a trinity just like we have a trinity and i think that's fine as long as you're not considering that avatar your savior no and no when they don't do that so they don't sure. do that so that's a big difference too is hindus don't talk about something saving you they very much you got to save yourself because you are i mean the bhagavad gita is one of the most profound book she'll ever read from from the, the hindu collection um and it's the story of arjuna and arjuna is a warrior and he has to go up he's standing on the battlefield of india and he's looking across the battlefield and he, he's gonna have to fight for the to the death for this land 
and he's looking across the battlefield the other side and he's seeing like his 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 teachers his friends people he loves and he doesn't want to do it he doesn't want to go to battle and he has this like literal come to jesus moment i say come to jesus moment because krishna is the avatar in this story and krishna is the christ krishna christ that's the christ and the whole bhagavad gita is arjuna having a conversation on the battlefield before going into battle with krishna about what he has to do and krishna is like but uh buckle up buttercup you better toughen up my friend you decided to be a warrior that's what you are you're a warrior that's what you signed up to do so you you got to go be a warrior you can't back out now this is your karma you've got to face this and so it's in, in a lot of ways hinduism is the ultimate anti-woke religion because it's like there you don't get a participation trophy right you you got to actually be here and you and that's what karma is you guys and, and i know in the western world so many people don't understand karma it's really quite sad people think karma is this bad like oh the karma bus is coming all karma is is cause and effect action reaction for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction that's what karma is that's all it is right because angie mama and daddy did the did the did the deed she was born and the karma of that is we get to celebrate her birthday with her you know like that's so so it's just because i drank water this morning an hour later the karma of that is not only is my body hydrated but i have to pee right so it's it's just action reaction and so sometimes when we have we go back to patanjali's teachings if we have attachments to things that are connected to the false sense of self which is the ego we will have negative reactions to the cause and effect given to us because of that right so there's no such thing there is no such thing as good karma or bad karma karma is just karma it's your perception of the cause and effect that makes it good or bad right something could happen to me an action and a reaction could happen to me that I think is the most horrific thing in the world. The same action and reaction could happen to Angie or Eric, and they could think it's not that bad. Your perception of that. And so when something, when an action and a reaction happens to you that makes you uncomfortable, that upsets you, your work then, the friction of that karma is then for you to change the perception so that you can gain the wisdom from the experience. And that's what starts to take the power of the ego away. Does that make sense? Yes. And how do we relate this back to the whole, like the, the strands of DNA and the. Basically, if you really understand the concepts of karma and you really accept karma is just simply your work, simply your action and your reaction. And you start to see, I'll say it again. I said it with Catherine this morning. I'll put this in a different way. So the type of yoga that I practice is a very, very physically challenge. Uh, traditional yoga is like, breaks you it's ashtanga yoga it just literally you are just it is not vinyasa flow that is not traditional yoga anyway so it's extremely difficult extremely challenging and my original teacher david greig in philadelphia who is the reason why i was able to go into india he's the one that that got me to that point when he would have you he, he would have these like 20 22 year old girls come into his shawa who had been gymnasts or cheerleaders and so they adapted a lot easier to the practice than maybe someone who who wasn't so athletic and those 20 22 year old girls that that had a you know easy to adapting he wasn't really interested and in, it was boring to him right but when like a 60 70 year old man walked into that shala who was overweight and couldn't touch his toes all of a sudden david would get so excited because now we have something to work with right so anytime there was a limitation of resistance a struggle instead of seeing that taught me instead of seeing the challenges in my life as something to be stressed about see them as something to work with something that's providing me resistance so that i can learn and grow right and so, I, of food. I mean i always think of like my cooking and stuff and it's the same way with like when i went to the farmer's market yesterday i picked out the ugliest vegetables that were on discount at the farmer's market to to pickle like i said no i'm gonna go i'm gonna go save these things <laughs> and make you know like this would like make these were like the ugliest carrots now look how pretty they are but right. and i you know i had to like really like shave off a bunch of like rotten stuff and like trim and and just 
but um, that's that's what makes that's what it makes me it think gives of. you something to work with and so if we're looking at activating the 10 the 10 you know asleep strands of dna my suggestion would be anytime you have a challenge in your life friction in your life don't run from it don't don't sulk just be mm -hmm. like oh interesting now i have something to work with because that karma that resistance that cause and effect is why you came to earth you didn't come to earth to eat french fries and watch the kardashians although that would be quite fun yeah. you came to earth to actually human runners are runners teachers are teachers swimmers are swimmers humans are humaning turn the idea of you being a human into a verb your soul came here to human your soul before your soul took the physical shakti so the body is in the yoga sutras there's there's two different words for the body prakriti is what the word that's used in the yoga sutras and that is nature mm -hmm. so nature is anything that has a birth a life and a death and because nature is on a birth and a life and a death cycle it's always changing and that also causes us to struggle because we confuse our nature we confuse the identity of our body with the identity of our soul. And so we're holding on to something that is mortal, thinking it's eternal, and it causes human suffering. That's why we fear death. But our body is just the expression of the soul. It's the Shakti, it's the Prakriti. So another word for that would be Shakti, which you hear that word a lot in, in Yoga Shala, Shakti. Your soul in the Yoga Sutras, it's called the Parusha. The Parusha is the eternal. So the Parusha is connected to Ishvara. Not Prakriti. Prakriti is just the experience. Parusha is what's connected. Your soul is what's connected to God. Right? The internal soul beneath that subtle body. The body is just the expressed experience of the soul. So the soul can refine itself to remember that it's connected to God, right? Another word for the soul is the Shiva, the Shiva, the Shakti, the Prakriti, the Purusha. And so when we're in these bodies, and in, and in the, as humans, we're, we're humaning, especially on our timeline, that we're, the, 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 the decision that your soul made, your soul sat there with God or whatever you believe, whatever you want to call higher, that higher state of, of God, and when you were sitting here as a soul figuring out what you were going to do in human school, and what lessons you needed to learn, it was areas that your soul needed to, to refine itself in. And so you sat down and said, I think I want to struggle with this, this, and this. And I want to have this karma and that karma. And here's something from a past life that I didn't quite figure out in that life. So can we bring that back into this life so I can finish it and I can try to figure this out? And so your God goes, okay, cool. Yeah, we're going to, that's your contract. We're going to do this, right? So people think their soul contract's like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the queen of the world. That's my soul contract. No, honey, your soul contract is you going through obstacles so that you can refine yourself for, you, for your soul. And so my soul contract was like, you're going to struggle with anxiety in this life. Like I, I was up there with God and I was like, I think I need, you know, these humans are calling it PTSD. I think I need some of that because I need to work on that within me, within my, my soul. Right. And so by coming to I earth, think my soul contract was just to be a wife and a mother. <laughs> nope. I'm like, no, it's I mean, I, I've been a wife and a mother. I mean, now who's Angie and the wife and the mother is just the karmic. So being a wife and a mother, I would say was a karmic uh, contract. So you made a karmic contract with your husband and with your kids to yeah. bring a certain flavor to and i would say for you angie more so with your husband to have a certain resistance a certain friction your family is the biggest karmic contracts you will ever have especially your parents and, and for a lot My of people the whole, yeah, yeah. And, and and how amazing is that that your blood brings the biggest lessons because you can't just always walk away from blood. Blood is always kind of lingering there in the corner, right? You always know your dad's there, even if you don't talk to him, right? So there's a big karmic lesson there. And so that is a karmic exchange of energy. And so you make these, these deals with these other souls, like not only am I going to do this for me, but we're going to have this relationship so that we can learn out from each other. 
so that we can have that. And sometimes it happens that one soul will learn the lesson while the other doesn't, right? And has to repeat that same lesson with somebody else in the next in the next life because they didn't figure it out, right? It's a really and good song if you haven't heard it from John Mayer, and it's called "In the Blood." It's good. Well, maybe it's yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, look at like my favorite thing with siblings. Like I love my sister. My sister and I don't really have, we're very dharmic in that way. We don't have a lot of karma, but there's this great meme I saw the other day. I thought it was perfectly described sibling relationships. If you need a kidney, I will absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt will give you a kidney, but you cannot use my phone charger. Like yeah. nothing describes a sibling relationship better than that. You could absolutely, I will die for you. I will give you that blood transfusion. I will give you my kidney, but don't you fucking touch my phone charger. You know, <laughs> like that is that sibling relationship, right? And there's also that bond with siblings too, because those siblings have also picked the same parents, mm -hmm. right? So there's going to be some similar friction. And so that then creates a, a connection between the sibling. Like nobody can bitch about your mama but you and your siblings. Yeah. Nobody knows that what's going on behind those closed door, but you and your siblings. And so there's a different kind of karmic there. So karma isn't bad or good. It just is what it calls an effect. So like there's a camaraderie with siblings a lot because they are the only two that really understand the complications and complexities of the household they grew up in and how that affects them as adults. Right. And mm -hmm. so that has to be observed. And when you can start to observe relationships in that way, you start to see them for what they are and you're not super emotionally invested to the point where it starts to destroy you. You start to be able to make peace with, with certain situations when you realize that this is all that is and the soul is eternal. That's why all these people are under this crazy idea, like batshit crazy idea that somebody's going to come along in, in this great awakening and bippity boppity boo they're dead ones who have died. They're dead loved ones out of the grave. Y'all, that's a zombie apocalypse. And their soul's gone. Right? And so if you bring a body back to life where the soul has moved on from that experience of that body, guess what, my friends? Something else can enter it. So don't be fooled by these satanic Christians because the soul has moved. And, and that's what gets me too is like, you your your time of death or your time of leaving this experience i'll say because death is just an illusion you've already got it planned it's already done like you agreed in your contract what what day you were going to exit the ride your soul's at peace with that because your soul knows it's eternal so when people are hoping that these fake truthers are going to go bippity boppity boo their loved ones back from the dead are you really not trusting god because that's showing your, that you lack faith in God. Because God made an agreement with that person. And how dare you try to interfere with their karmic path? That's not your place. I wrote down the other day. I, <laughs> kind of sounds weird, I guess. But I wrote down, you are really not that important to someone else's soul. <laughs> right? <laughs> when, you, when you accept that, that somebody like, else has their own job. It. Like, just stop it. I mean, that was stop a karmic it. relationship, you know, with my papa and my grandma and my, you know, whatever. But, but no, that was just a, a chapter in their uh, karmic journey. And I don't, I mean, I really, I mean, maybe I'll see them again. You know, people are like, oh, I'm going to see them again in heaven. And I'm like, well, I mean, maybe, I mean, who knows? I don't know. I mean, but. No, I mean, that's not what this is about. <laughs> no, and you have to make peace. So so people who are still, now it's one thing to love someone and miss someone. Absolutely, you can love them. But I love and miss people who are still alive that I don't see and talk to anymore, right? So you loving and missing, that's part of that grieving process. And that's a process you have to go through in your own karmic journey. But you have to make peace with, if you are so addicted to somebody else that you can't go on without them resurrecting from the dead and being a zombie, uh -huh. there's something wrong with you. You need to be able to be at peace with yourself and being at peace with the, the wholeness of who you are. And when my papa was dying, because we knew he was, you know, this is years ago, back in the early 90s, I actually told him, I said, Papa Maxie, 
I said, you know, that cemetery in the backyard that you're so scared of, they had like the cemetery in the backyard. So when they bought the land, there was just the Tyson family, whatever was buried in the backyard. And my grandma like fixed it up and, you know, like put all the headstones back together and, you know, better cemented them and things. He was terrified of that cemetery at night. My papa was. And so I told him when, when we knew he was dying, I said, now, you know how scared you are of that cemetery? He said, I love you so, so, so very much. Please don't come back and visit me. Don't come. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't mind like feeling like, oh, you know, my so we you don't want to see the ghost. <laughs> But if I were to see like the zombie apocalypse of my grandma, oh, I shit my pants. Like, yeah. So, like, <laughs> no. Well, listen, as God is my witness, I'm going to be burned when I die because I don't want anybody mm. to use my body for spare parts. <laughs> um, but I, I so that's I've never seen him in his casket. I put a picture of me and him together, like in it, you know, like it. I mean, you know, it's what I did. And, but I remember going, that does not look like him at all. No, because the soul's gone. Yeah, that's why when you see a dead body, it doesn't look like them because the soul is. Gone. Do you know that the eye? I learned this recently driving down and listening to the podcast. The eye actually like sinks back when you die. Like your your actual eyeball goes poop back into your eyes. And so at the funeral par parlors, they have to put like marble into the eyelid so it appears when the eye is closed that the eyes. So that shows you that when that the body starts decomposition right away, really when the soul leaves. So your loved one has moved on. Mm. Do, not, do not try to harness them back because, and do you really have that little faith in God that you would question the death date that God assigned with your loved one? Are you really that narcissistic that you think you have power to override somebody else's soul contract? If you love them, let them go. If you love them, let them go. You will see their soul again. Not, but remember, the soul knows once you're in that state of death, when, the, when you're free, your soul is all knowing at that point. So it's not attached. Thinking about our past life, I think about past lives. I know I lived. I'm not attached to those lives. Oh, that's cool. That's how I because I'm not there. I'm here. I'm, and I actually like being Bryce. I'm I'm having quite fun. I've done a lot of work in this life. Listen, listen, Linda. Listen, I don't want to come back. I've done a lot of work in this life. So. It, Linda, I love it. Listen, Linda. I've done a. I ain't coming back here, y'all. I'm going to be. Mm. So so anyway, but um, but so when we're talking about the ten missing tribes of Israel and trying to activate that DNA, there's no magic pill. That's going to do that for you. There's no healer that's going to bippity boppity boo that for you. There's no med bed that's going to do that for you. What's going to do that for you is you leaning yeah. into your work, leaning into your shadow work, leaning into the places of yourself that are resisting, that are hard, because that's where, that's why in yoga, the lotus flower is often the symbol of yoga. Why? Because it grows on top of mud. It has to go through the mud and the muck in order to bloom. So be that lotus flower. Go through your own. Face yourself. Face yourself. Get on that track. And that's another thing, too, about exercises. It does bring up, because you're moving that, that water, you're moving that energy. Old shit does come up that needs to come up. And when it does, lean into it. If you're exercising. I'm going to start crying. Like, yeah. I was about to say, it happens in yoga shalas all the time. We just ignore it. Like if someone starts crying, they're mad, I just ignore it because it happens all the time and it needs to happen. So if you're doing a run and all of a sudden you feel like you need to go in the corner and cry, you just start crying. Do it. Release it. Release it. And then over time, you're going to bring more life into your DNA strands. And so the soul is going to be able to wiggle, wiggle those DNA <clears throat> strands straight, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I just so. Yeah. I will tell y'all, I know we've been over an hour now, but I'll tell a real funny story. I think it's funny anyway, about ghosts, because everything's haunted down here in South. So our yoga shawl is haunted. It's, we got a, we got a guy, I call him Tom. I don't know if that's his name, but that's kind of the name I felt like was his name. And mm -hmm. he is from, obviously he was a soldier from the Civil War. My boyfriend has seen the full apparatus, has seen his full apparition. apparition. Yeah. That's the word. <laughs> um, I've only I've heard him. I've heard him a lot. And there, and he walks around, and he's he's an intelligent spirit. He knows he's not. He, but this is where a lot of civil war stuff happens. So it's not the shala that's haunted. It's like the land um, around the shala. 
And so there was one morning, it was like five o'clock in the morning. It was dark outside. I was sitting in the office. I was teaching a lead class that morning and I was in the office and I heard the boots walking around in the main room. And I, and it always confuses you because you think like a student's in there. So I opened the door to see, and, it, and I knew it was the ghost, but he was super active that morning. I think that was the morning I'd walked in and like both the sinks were turned on in the bathroom and the sink in the office. Sometimes that would happen. They'd be on full blast where no one left them running. All the sinks are turned on full blast. Anyway, I, um, I remember saying, cause he was so active that morning. I was like, Hey Tom, I was like, I have to teach a class in a, in a bit. And I only have the pair of yoga pants on that I'm wearing currently right now. If you show yourself to me this morning, I most certainly will shit my pants. And I don't have a change of pants. So now in your day, women were ladies. And so you don't, you don't want a lady having to teach with shitty pants, do you? <laughs> and, you please, and at that, it stopped. It completely stopped. Um, and there's a, there's like an Italian restaurant in the same vicinity it sh shares land in that in that area it used to be like this new aged uh hippie buddha tea shop and there's a big old buddha statue in there that it take, took many people to pull it in and get it situated in the corner and oftentimes they'd walk in and the buddha statue would be on the other side of the room mm -hmm. um there's also a little preschool there and they'd come in and their toys the toys would be everywhere in the morning so um so yeah we but yeah yeah, so that was my story with Tom. I was like, do not show yourself to me. I will shit my pants. I do not have time for this at five o'clock in the morning on a mm -hmm. Friday. <laughs> so, but anyway, is there anything you guys want to close out with today? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I've said this before. Um, we are creators. Our words have power and authority. And yeah, that's... That's it. That's all I have. Power in the tongue. Mm -hmm. Power in the that tongue. That sounds like a porno. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I was crazy crazy power in the tongue. I was like, I didn't <laughs> say that to me. Girl, I said somebody said that to me. It was a good date night in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> well life okay there's life and death in the tongue right? yeah there you go that's life better and in the bible <laughs> there's a happy ending in that tongue <laughs> <laughs> i'm kind of a crazy dude i mean this little airbnb i'm in in charleston has a little outdoor tub and i've just been oh, having i love it i know it's mm -hmm. not it's hot. Oh, in the oh in the yeah. Afternoon, it's I take a cold shower. And then in the mornings, I take a kind of warm shower. You can't, I mean, it, it's it's hot here. And it's hot. like buggy. I'm burning all kinds of, like, I light up incense all around the yard just to keep the mosquitoes away. You need, you, you talk about like a sweat lodge. There you go. Listen, <laughs> that is why I question the history. Cause like I said, that's where my family's from there. And I know how hot it gets there. And that swampy Charleston. I'm like, how the hell were they walking around in petticoats? And oh my God, the flies. Like, how are they doing that? We don't mean that Batman. It's hard for us. And we have full on air conditioning and strapless shirts and like bikinis. And how... How were these European or European Europeaners for for from Northern Europe who were used to the? I'm sorry, people from Northern Europe. No matter how hot you think it's getting in your summertime, it is nothing because I've been there. It's nothing compared to the heat that we experience. Listen, mm -hmm. I spent time in Africa twice. African heat is nothing compared to the southeastern heat. India heat is nothing compared to the heat. Yeah, it's just thick. It's, thick. it's heavy. It breathes on you. Talking about a tongue, I heard somebody say it feels like you're in someone's mouth because it's just wet all the time and hot and gross. And and I, one of my English friends said it was like walking through a bowl of hot soup. You know, it's like it's disgusting. So, yeah, I drove. I can't believe I did that, but I drove straight straight here from Athens. I never stopped. So you know what I that? It was like almost five hours because there was all this traffic and stuff. I mean, it was a, you know, I got here during rush hour. But like, so when I opened the door, when I got here, it was like, you hear, you hear all the like, oh, the cicadas, cicadas, yeah. and I'm like, <laughs> what the, and, and the 
I mean, it just hits you like it's it so hits you like a slap. So how the fuck were these people walking around in bonnets and petticoats coming from northern Europe? Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. Right. That's I'm I'm calling bullshit on that story. I'm saying Tartaria. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, it is it is um it's it's definitely it's it, I'm in control. Somebody <laughs> said something about Charleston too. They're like it, the city breathes. I was like it does. It breathes on you. It spits on you. Like it is so freaking hot. Um, it is just it is you know I I will say when I lived in England for I've said this before when I lived in England for a bit, me and the guy I was dating at the time who was South African. Um, we couldn't figure out why we were the only two out of everyone we lived with that were constantly bathing. Like we would take like two or three showers or baths a day and our English friends would only bathe like every other day or something. We couldn't figure it out why we were so apt to like bathe. And then we were like, Oh, it's because we come from warm, sticky climates. So like you have to bathe a lot because you're so fucking sweaty. I mean, you get, I get bra sweats and you get like rashes on your chest. It's just, it's, it's, it's so freaking hot. Like it is so hot anyway. So that's, that's where Miss Angie is. Well, Atlanta's hot too, but I'm loving it. I mean, I'm not trying to, trying to say Charleston's not a good place. It's swampy. No, no, Charleston's my favorite place in the world. Like, that's the place where I feel my DNA really goes because the low country does something to me. Like, the low country is like really, it pulls me all the time. Like, I, yeah, my DNA tomorrow, but I probably will. I'll probably find something else to get into around here before you I gotta go out. find the Bryce Street and the Strom Street. Those are two of my families in Charleston. I've never found these streets, but apparently they're there in Charleston. And it's both my mom, my mom's, my grandmother was a Strom, and my grandfather was a Bryce. That's where I get my name is my mother's maiden name. Mm. So find there's a Bryce Street and there's a, especially the Stroms. Apparently the Stroms help build they help they were responsible for building like this is a thing too like spell so strong spell strong s-t-r-o-m or it could be spelled the way it was spelled the germanic way which is s-t-r-u-m so i'll this is what cracks me up so apparently the stroms they were the vunstroms when they came over from germany in like the 1600s they landed in charleston <laughs> Charles Town, as it was called then they couldn't speak english they only spoke german so they weren't taken in like the first census because they couldn't speak english but they helped build the city and so they went back and gave them like streets and name because they helped build the city of charleston strom thurman who is my grandmother's first cousin He's that, Strom Thurman Boulevard. I'm looking at Strom Matt. Thurman. That's my grandmother's first cousin. So, like me, he had his mother's maiden name. Apparently, I met him when I was a young kid. I, we, I apparently, I colored in some books he had given my. He gave it my. Says that's in Columbia, South Carolina. So. Well, that's where the cap, cap, capital is Columbia. So, yeah, Strom Thurman was like the longest running senator, and he uh, from South Carolina. Anyway, he's a famous. Uh, uh, that was my grandmother's family, the, the Strom. So, my grandmother was Maxine Strom. My grandfather was Boyce Bryce. Um, was his last anyway um so so the the, the uni university of south carolina the stadium the game cock stadium is the williams bryce stadium i was told when i was in high school that if i wanted to go to the university of south carolina i didn't even need to take the sats they just let me in and i was like who the fuck wants to be a game cock <laughs> i was like listen my name is bryce you really think i hate football i fucking hate football i was like you really think i'm gonna go to a school where the football stadium for the gamecocks is called the williams bryce stadium and my name is bryce like how obvious is that anyway so I remind me off air to um tell you about a little business idea i have that has okay. something oh yes it has something to do with the word cock <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's my, that's how South, that's how fucking South Carolina. I mean, I, I from Atlanta, but my family is so South Carolina. Like, so when I, I mean, it's so my, my whole, but I always laugh because like my German, they tell me my German family came from Germany in like the 1600s. They sailed the seas, landed in Charleston, and then no one left for like 300 years. And then my family was like, my mom was like, let's go to actually it was my grandfather my mom was born there lived there for a bit and they came to georgia because my grandfather was the head of surgery for a clinic so like you're telling me for 300 years they were they did, made all that journey over from germany and they're like we're just gonna stay right here where it's real hot and swampy right. we're not gonna venture into the like, yeah. you know but i will say when i go to charleston i feel it like i remember i was driving to charleston once with my sister it was just the two of us in the car and there's this point when you're driving where you feel it go, like you feel it go into the low, mm -hmm. feel it shift where the, the elevation drops. And my sister and I were quiet and we just went, and my sister goes, man, that gets me every time. 
like dropping into the low country because you feel it. We feel it in our DNA. Our DNA activates mm -hmm. if we ever take. You know, I am too. You. I feel it here and I feel it up in Appalachia. So I feel like there's, I don't know things, but I don't mm -hmm. feel it where I grew up in South Georgia. I no, don't. I think, well, where I grew up, and I have no, so I have no ties to Georgia uh, in my heritage, <laughs> right? So there's no heritage here for me. There's heritage in Charleston. Mm -hmm. There's no heritage here. Right. This is my this is where I grew up. It's home, but it's not my heritage. I will say, girl, though, Angie and Eric and anybody watching, if you ever take a road trip with me, we will not be doing that drive in one swoop because my ass loves gas station food. Okay. I'm going to be stopping and getting some Doritos and getting some Skittles because that, that's the that fun. jalapeno cheddar dip in the can. That's like a road trip. I love that meme. Every every adult should treat a road trip like they're a ten year old with an unlimited debit card. Like you can just go crazy, and that's the fun of it. So anyway, I know you're a vegetarian, but I mean, I I do like my jerky. I yeah, know jerky. Mm -hmm. I know. gross. I'll can just like, hide it over here. But I can make it out of mushrooms. I've got some. I made some yesterday here out of mushrooms. Interesting. All right, guys. I know we're like well over an hour now. We're just having fun with you guys. But let us know. I Hopefully that was informative for people. I know people get freaked out when they realize that they're, they're the answer they seek. But that is what Yahshua taught you guys. Don't listen to the fucking church. It's a cult. It's a death cult. You are the one you have been waiting for. You are. You are mm -hmm. the one you have been waiting for. Exactly. You, God is inside of you. You are a fractal. Yourself, I mean, you're going to be lost. I mean, you're not going to, you're searching, you're seeking outside of yourself, which is what Satan wants. Yes. And this great yeah. awakening isn't about all the, uh, the things we're learning. It's really about you understanding awakening to yourself. Mm -hmm. So she, only, only you, only you can prevent forest fires. Only you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> little, little 90s flashback there. After I said that, I was like, Hello. I don't remember those commercials. Oh, like you yeah. remember the forest fires. You remember the, the commercials with the egg where they were like, this is your brain. This is your brain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those commercials that, didn't work. That egg, that egg looked really good, too. <laughs> they all still in drugs. They didn't work. Um, anyway, so you guys, so anyway, um, you are you are the person that you seek. You mm -hmm. are you are a soul. You are a never ending soul, and you use right. that resistance you feel to work on yourself to lean into yourself. There are so many tools available to you, including talk talk therapy. I'm a huge believer in talk therapy. All sorts of stuff available to you. And so um, I hope that you guys are well. And if you have any questions about it, leave it down in the comment section below. And make sure to go watch Shiny Happy People, you guys. If you grow up in a very conservative Christian home, this might be something you want to watch to help liberate yourself from the evils of man. All right, you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. <laughs>